two guanine spear points. Seeing that they're made of gold, Chris, you know how Europeans are with gold, right? So mm -hmm. Chris goes, whoa, yo, where'd you get the gold? And they said, we got it from these black guys from south across the water. No, 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 wait, I'm the first. How, how did that happen? So he takes the guanine spear points, goes to back to Portugal, shows them to the king. The king says, oh, guanine. Wait, that's what those Indians called it. Yes, it's from Ghana. Okay, so the guanine is, in order to make a spear point from gold, you have to alloy it with copper and silver. So it's hard enough to make a spear point. And the precise formula came from Ghana. Today we call it 14 karat gold. Right? So, other folks had visited Turtle Island before this particular European. So, from the word, from his name, we get the Cristobal Colon, we get the concept of colonize, colony, and the doctrine of discovery. So, to colonize something means that you make the people that were once free totally dependent on you. You also erase their culture in favor of your cultural pattern, and so the colony then produces goods for the quote-unquote new mother country. Okay, which is not just a European concept, so I'm not even saying that. Okay, but here is a European concept that originated from this discovery, and it's called the Doctrine of Discovery. Okay, so now I'm doing deconstruction. Not just hero is the teller of the tale. The Doctrine of Discovery works like this. 1493, Columbus gets back. Two separate popes, one in 1493 and another in 1501 or two, Spanish pope, Portuguese pope. We had separate popes. Then, different parts of the world, right? Doctrine of discovery goes like this. Any Christian, and at that time, Christianity was whites only, as far as Europeans were concerned. Any Christian that discovered non-Christian lands could claim that land for all of Christendom and the indigenous inhabitants lost title to it forever. Even if they converted to Christianity. Sound crazy? Mm -hmm. Guess what? It's case law. <laughs> Doctrine of discovery, okay? So, this is how, without making landfall, the Russians discovered Alaska and then sold it to the Americans the next year. Now, notice I said, without making landfall. No boots on the ground, nothing. Because they ain't going to mess with the Tlingit Haida because they're a military power. I know the Tlingits. Yeah, the Tlingits from Alaska, all the salmon streams from Alaska down to California. They're trading salmon for abalone and all that other kind of stuff. They're a military empire. They're, They're pretty badass. They're cannibals. Well, maybe, but not the only ones on the planet. I haven't heard that. In any case, the doctrine of discovery works like this. There's a Supreme Court decision, U.S. Supreme Court, Johnson v. McIntosh. Two white guys. One bought the land in the land office. The other inherited the land from the Indians. Land dispute. Who owns the land? Goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which operates on a principle in... I don't know if you're legal scholars, but I studied this and it blew my mind. Stare decisis, which means literally let the decision stand. So a previous court that has made a decision on the area of law that you're, that's made a ruling on the 
the area of law that you're looking at, let that decision stand if we've never encountered this before. So where do they go? Do they go to the Iroquois Six Nations Court, which was established in 1120? Do they do that? No. They do not do that. They're going to get the answer they're not looking They want the answer that they want. Okay? So the Pope, because remember, a papal bull. It's a proclamation by the Pope, papal bull. That's what it's called. It's not really a comment on the veracity of the content. Papal bull is law. So here's what happened. The Pope in Rome, and not in Rome, but in uh, Spain said, okay, any Christian that discovers non-Christian lands claims that land for all Christianity. The Supreme Court uses that decision as the basis for giving the land to the guy that bought it from the land office. And what was interesting, the Chief Justice writing the opinion said, this is not the moral thing to do. If we were going to do the moral and right thing to do, then all Europeans should leave America. I mean, he's writing that. But we ain't going to do that. Decision in favor of this plaintiff. Boom. OK, so, so you think that Pope in 1493 has any influence? Um, are we a Catholic nation? Uh, no. Founding fathers decided we're not a Christian nation either. So why are we going to that? Hmm. Because they did know that there were Native American courts. They knew that. They knew that. Native American governments, too. So, doctrine of discovery. So it's not just innocuous. That words. Words have meaning, words have power. So, in the African first contact, centuries before, the mission was trade and exploration, not conquest. I mean, if you look at a globe that basically shows you the side, you know, North America can fit inside of Africa. So the African explorers coming to Turtle Island are not, we don't need land. We got Africa. We don't need gold. We brought our own gold. But we are interested in trading technology, mm -hmm. genes, and technology. So what does the hero leave out of the narrative and the story? So ethnic studies is the interdisciplinary study of the stories that got left out of the narrative of Western civilization, also known as the traditional canon of Western civilization. Now, the reason it's called canon, a canon is a song, a hymn, sung in church. This was dating, this phrase is dating back to when the Catholic Church not only was the church, but also ran the university system, too, and influenced it heavily. That's why y'all have participated in a graduation sometime in your life, maybe? What do you wear on graduation day? Cap and gown. Cap and gown. And where is that from besides Europe? What is that symbolic of? The choir. <laughs> well, not only a choir, that's good. Not only a choir, but y'all are monks. Monks. Okay? Y'all are monks. And the professorate is wearing a cowl, like a hood, just like Jedi's, right? except their particular discipline. And y'all as students, because, you know, y'all as students are wearing the cap of a student and also the mortarboard that you used to write down your lessons on. OK? Which is basically symbolic of a certain form of education. All right? Traditional canon of Western civilization. So what is the church going to leave in and leave out? What's their, going, what's their world going to be? So as an example, discussing with this with my dentist, like the idea, 
Well, because this dentist, I'm not going to plug her on television, but yeah, she's great. Very tech forward. Very tech forward. So we were talking about science and the implications for you know morality, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe you will learn this, but I'll just tell you about this up front. Abortion technology is 5,000 years old. That's before Christianity, Islam, and most of Judaism. Okay? The same people that gave us the cesarean section gave us, well, not D and C exactly, because you don't, they didn't have vacuums, but they had abortion technology because their language the secret language, the hieroglyphics, the language of the priests and royalty, the let literally some of the letters, they have ten different letters for parts of the eye from dissecting the eye. That's their language. Body parts, among other things. They're the ones that develop surgery. Right? Because their spiritual belief is that Well just look at mummification. You know, yeah. Right, all that stuff. So their belief was that your in your life is independent of the body. Alrighty, so aborting was well, it's just like cutting a fingernail. You may not agree with that. That's their worldview. That's why you develop their technology, because their belief is you do not develop or release a technology without assessing its impact on the spirituality of the people. So whatever, wherever you're, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, whatever, <clears throat> understand that these debates have been going on for a long time. Technology does influence your morality. Does influence you. It biases you. I both leaped at and kind of cursed moving to television as a means for this class. One, it gets out farther, but another way it conditions people to passively absorb information, which they may or may not absorb later. So, West, traditional canon of Western civilization. So, we use in ethnic studies the same standards of evidence where the evidence exists. Okay, so we'll use books, we'll use writing, we'll use the same historical evidence that historians use. However, we will also look at other things. So it's an interdisciplinary field. Notice what I've done. I've basically talked about quantum physics, legal, the psychology of law, psychology, et cetera, et cetera. This ain't just straight history. I'm just using history as a framework. History to a people is like memory to a person. Okay, if you have brain damage, you get amnesia. Right? That's not considered mental health, amnesia. It comes from damage, something happening, right? Taking out a people's history damages them. Right? So, we don't want to do that. We're going to, and sometimes giving you too much information ain't a great thing either, but I would rather err on giving you too much. So, we interrogate the traditional canon. That means we ask questions, and we ask hard questions. And I would encourage you to ask me hard, ask hard questions of me and or yourself. Interrogations aren't comfortable. Right? And it's assumption of superiority and total knowledge. So, a maroon griot. This I found on the internet, and it's captioned, Dancing Slave. Now, you don't arm slaves. <laughs> so, Brother Man's got a gun. He's got a hatchet. You see this skull, presumably of an enemy, and other folks. The Taino referred to, again, yeah, he's got an afro, right? So, not necessarily what we would consider an Indian Indian, 
but he might be a maroon. And maroon is a Taino word for a first-generation African native hybrid, genetic and cultural hybrid, right? I like it better than black Indian. Because <laughs> a maroon, in their language, means wild and free. All right? So everywhere there was slavery in the so-called New World, there were maroon societies on the outskirts of it where escaped slaves would go and where maroons would actually raid plantations to free slaves. There is also a tradition of pirates raiding slave ships and freeing slaves and killing the crew or giving the crew, you join us or die, and the slaves got the same deal, join us or die. Which would you rather, you wanna follow the crew into the Davy Jones locker, or you wanna be free? This is a griot, also known as a jolly, who's playing a cora. So I'm an American maroon griot. Griot or jolly is a combination, historian, diplomat, poet, musician, storyteller, healer. African, gen African and Native American genetic and cultural hybrid. So, I so begin tying opposites together using diunital and sometimes quadriunital logic. Okay, so let's do a dissection of memes. So, have you heard that Barack Obama is a Muslim? Now, the last, one of the times that I taught this class in 2008, so it comes in two year cycles, right? We were in the middle of an election. So I actually had this discussion with uh, this white guy, a white surfer from Orange County, who was in Hilo dissing Obama. She didn't think, wow, you got some stones dissing Obama in Hawaii, where everybody, all the locals consider him a native son. Have you ever heard that Barack Obama is a Muslim? Well, that's a meme. So a meme is not necessarily true. It's like a virus of the mind. It doesn't have to be true, but it does spread. So the evidence given for this is his middle name. So Barack Hussein Obama. So what I broke down to this guy was, all right, when you name a kid, they were back in the day, names meant something. And the meaning of the name that you gave to the child, if it wasn't an ancestor, was basically to inspire the child in life. You know, hope, chastity, whatever. Okay, same here. So, who was the biblical Barak? Because he claimed to be a Christian, so I'm trying to teach him using his own culture, right? Well, I don't know. Okay. In Judges, there's a general mentioned in Judges. This is when the nation of Israel, after the Exodus, was ruled by judges. And there was a female judge, Deborah, the only female judge in Judges, who dispatches the good general Barak on a mission. That's important. So Baraka, in Arabic, means blessing and a good general in Hebrew. The historical Hussein was the prophet's grandson who was murdered. And then his follow followers reconquered the city that he was murdered because he was basically murdered on his way to negotiate a peace contract. He was killed by the enemy and then his followers later basically reconquered the city 80 years later. So Hussein has become a symbol of overcoming oppression. That's why you give that name. Oh, it's the same as Saddam Hussein. Right, that's like Joe, Kathy, okay? <laughs> Brittany, <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Tyler. So Barack was named for his African father but raised by his Caucasian mother and her parents as a Christian. Is not raised in the African-American old school mother wit, but did marry into it. 
with Michelle. So, African in America, Alkebulan is the oh, Alkebulan is the indigenous name for that continent. Africa is the Greek name for that continent. They may mean the same thing. Just like Egypt, Egypt means is a Greek word which means land of the blacks. Kemet, which is the indigenous name for that country, land of the blacks. Ethiopia, land of the people with the burnt faces. Al Africa, land of the blacks. Al Kabulan, land of the blacks. So we see a pattern here. Right. So, Africa is the source of our strength. Atalanta, one African name for this turtle island. Tulipid, Atalanta literally means water and metal. There's a trading relationship. I told you that, right? So what are they trading for, among other things? Tulipit Wapakisanet, the long-reaching land. It's an indigenous word, which basically means, again, North, Central, and South America, also shortened to be Turtle Island and America. So Africa is the sources of our strength. America is the test of our strength. In Africa, knowledge comes through, you get strength through self-knowledge. In America, you often get strength through creating fear and ignorance. Separation. Divide and conquer. Ancient strategy before Europe and before other folks, it was old. But in Africa, your strength comes from self-knowledge. America, fear and ignorance. As the oldest people within our scientific framework, as Africans, it's our responsibility to remember, just like the oldest child in a family is supposed to remember what the parents taught and be an example for other folks. So this course is designed to basically help you do that. Learn, because ultimately we're all Africans, if you believe the concept of Lucy. Remembering, remembering out loud. So, ethnic studies is a co collection of tales told by the indigenous about themselves using their worldview. So, Africa is the Greek name for Al Kabbalan, and America is the European name for Tulipit Wapakisanet. And the book that I use for that is a book uh, by Winterhawk called Circular Thought. Atalanta, it's a committee name for Turtle Island. Copy that, thanks. Also known as the Circuit of the World, and the only continent that stretches from pole to pole. Uh, there is a set of books, uh, that, a trilogy that called Shades of Memnon, which basically kind of tells that story from that point of view. It's historical fiction. So whether it's real or not, how fictional it is, you can make up your own mind. But think, consider this in terms of the fictions that we were raised on. How do they rule our lives? How does your belief, where do your beliefs come from? What are the stories, you know? It's like, it's going to, does anybody believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny? Okay, so you were told those things as if they were real for a time. The Tooth Fairy. You were told those things as if they were real, and at some point when you grew up, you realized, oh, oh, it's my parents, or, or your parents say, oh, it's the spirit of giving, or whatever fictions that we tell children until they grow up. Well, there are other things that could be just as fictional, but some people can run their lives on fictions as well as reality. So just good to know what the source of things are. And then choose. If you're going to live and how you're going to live. So the real African-American experience does not, of course, begin in 1619. That's why I don't start there. And to say it starts in 1619 is essentially a lie. So 
Repetition of a lie does not make it true. 9-11 was not planned by Saddam Hussein. Obama's not trying to take your guns, redistribute your wealth, or put you under Sharia law. <laughs> the African-American experience starts before there was even a united Europe and before there was even a Western civilization. So it can start at least at 850 to 1000 BCE or early, definitely 800 CE. which is where carbon dating places the Olmec heads, among other things. So pre-Columbian, as they say in the Western canon. So I start in 12,000 because it's a reasonable compromise between all the different tales that are competing. So Kemet, as was noted, says that time begins 36,000 years ago. Okay, Western civilization says nearly half a million years old, or actually a quarter, a quarter of them, 250,000 or 200,000 years old. Not going to start in 200,000, but I want to start in 12 because it's reasonable. All right? So um, acquire the book if you have the books if you have not. Uh, do the reading. The assignment isn't due till next week. Any questions in the last minute? The extra credit assignment is The extra credit assignment is not due till next week. Because I want you to be able to think about it, not try and produce shoddy work in 48 hours. No. All right. Oh, look, back in the Oh, look, Cottage Grove. Okay. Wow, excellent timing. All right, we're done. Thank yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. I'm sorry. Good job. That was you.